Здравейте на всички. Добре дошли в Френски културен институт, на който искам специално да благодаря за а, партньорството и за съдействието за тази лекция. Това е последната от а, този курс, тази годишния курс от лекции въведения в съвременното изкуство, които а, организираме съвместно от няколко години с а, отворени изкуства и с Веси Сариева. А, така, тъй като тази, тази лекция ще бъде на английски язик и няма да има превод, аз ще а, започна сега да говоря на английски и, и цялата лекция ще бъде на английски. След това ще имаме, както обикновено, време за въпроси. Така че... А, да. а, hello, Isabella. I have, the, I have the, the pleasure to present you Isabella Maidment. Um, she's here... Um, because Open Arts Foundation and Vesi Sarieva invited her for our course of lectures. Um, she's curator in Tate Modern since 2014, and she's responsible for the exhibitions, acquisitions, uh, displays at Tate, and also uh, together with Catherine Wood. You are uh, responsible also for the program uh, BMW uh, Tate Life program, yeah. Am I correct? It's true. <laughs> it's all true. Uh, Isabella is also a specialist on post-war performance, and she carries a PhD uh, on post-war performance. And um, Isabella, thank you to be here with us, and um, we we will be happy to pose you some questions after your uh, presentation. Thank you all for this very warm welcome. It's really wonderful to be here in Sofia. Uh, it's my first time in Bulgaria, so it's a very special trip. So this afternoon I will be giving a brief introduction um, to the history of the presentation and the collection of performance at Tate. So together with Catherine Wood, our senior curator of international art and performance, I co-curate the Tate Live program. And what that does is it aims to articulate the pivotal role of live experimentation, both historically, but also among contemporary artists working today. And this afternoon, what I'd like to outline for you is a sense of the work really that we're doing. So I'll start by talking about the acquisition of performance into the permanent collection at Tate, the way in which live works have been acquired since 2004. And then I'll go on to talk about the programming of performance, um, both in physical and in virtual spaces. And then I'll talk a little bit about two pioneering exhibition formats. If, mu um, sorry, if Tate Modern was Musée de la Danse and the new annual Tate Live exhibition, 10 Days, Six Nights, which is something that we launched in March earlier this year. So we're at an interesting point now within contemporary art practice where since the turn of the millennium, artists have been turning to performance, to live action, almost as frequently as they use painting, as sculpture, photography, or other lens-based media. Um, art practices were the basis or relationship to performance play an increasingly important role within the story told by the Contemporary Art Museum. And that's both in terms of the way that we look back on the evolution on the medium, but also the way we think about presenting recent work. Since the late 18th century, the role of the museum has been really to preserve and display object artworks um, that together constitute a cultural heritage. The permanent collection's role traditionally has been to position us as human subjects, both in relation to our past and towards an imagined future. If we invite living actions into this sort of museum, this institution that's role traditionally has been to preserve objects in perpetuity. I'd like to begin with an example of one live work in Tate Modern's permanent collection. A performance or action acquired by Tate in 2009. 
The artwork medium line reads simply, performance. Two people and two horses. Unusual materials for a museum to acquire. Titled Tatlin's Whisper Number no. 5, the work in question is by the Cuban artist and activist Tanya Bruguera. And the title is a reference to the Soviet modernist ar artist Vladimir Tatlin's Monument to the Third International of 1919, which with, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar, a work that was conceived but ultimately never built. Looking at this work, as you can see it here being performed in the Turbine Hall at the heart of Tate Modern on the bridge, it's hard to imagine an artwork that could look more different than a traditional art object. So this piece was the second live performance to be accessioned into the permanent collection. And the work was acquired as a set of instructions or as a kind of score that stipulated the exact specifications for its reactivation. The first of those instructions is that the museum, that we as curators in the institution, employ two real mounted police officers. And their task is to enter the museum unannounced. Tanya Bruguera conceives of the work as like a gunshot. It's that surprising in an institutional context. They enter on horseback and they start performing real crowd control techniques, ones that might be used in a context of civil unrest, a riot or a major rock concert. So Tate acquired the rights to present this work in public and in exhibitions following the conditions provided in the contract that accompanied the work certificate of authenticity. On the subject of the acquisition of the work, Tanya Bruguera stated that the museum was not collecting an object or an event, but rather a form that she described as an urgency, a term which highlights the very insistent nature of LifeWorks institutional address. So this piece then operates not only as a live image of public order, of real authority inserted into the museum, but also as a play of temporalities. Through this strategic crafting of a sense of urgency, Bruguera affects a sudden present reality that disrupts the traditionally homogeneous temporality of the museum that permanent, ordered reality on which the 19th century art museum was originally built. So traditionally, the museum has been understood as a technology that monumentalizes artifacts. And that very process stems from a historical displacement. It is that that I will be suggesting this afternoon through its liveness, performance actively resists. So how did Tate arrive at this point when a work such as this could enter the permanent collection? I wanted to sketch out a brief history of performance at Tate, the backstory that explains how we got to the present moment. The very first performance at the then Tate Gallery in Pimlico in London was in fact not programmed by the museum at all. It was rather a critical intervention against another work that was commissioned. Now known by the title Unscheduled Action, the work in question took place on the 5th of March 1968 and was instigated by the British artist Stuart Brisley. The action took place during a live presentation by the French sculptor César. He was displaying a new and very spectacular process of working with a quick hardening of liquid polyurethane presented to a very specially invited audience at the Tate Gallery. So he conceived of that evening as a special event, a private event to display his new innovative sculptural process. However, Brisley really saw it as um, bourgeois entertainment. And together with his friend, Peter Sedgley, he intervened by removing a portion of the completed work to the lawn in the front of the museum and setting it on fire. 
Very little evidence of that work exists anymore. It lives on in institutional memory. But the conflict with the institution at the heart of that action, I think, is significant. The dominant narratives of performance have tended to position the medium as antagonistic to the institution of the museum. But as I've hoped to show this afternoon, the relationship between live artworks and the museum today is really very much dialogic in character, rather than one necessarily defined by institutional critique. So this potted history gives a sense of the shape of the way in which performance have evolved over time. Our program was launched in 2003. Since then, there have been over 200 performances commissioned. The first acquisition took place in 2005. And importantly, in 2012, the tanks opened at Tate Modern. These were the first ever museum galleries designated to the presentation of live performance, installation, and work made with the moving image. So that was a groundbreaking moment for us. That year also coincided with Tino Segal's first live turbine hall commission, the first time that that commission had been given over to a performance. So it really acknowledged a, a broader shift in terms of contemporary practice away from an object focus tradition. There's more information online for those of you who are interested about uh, a very important research project performance at Tate, which happened in 2015, which my colleagues led on, and which is a very important initiative for thinking about this area that we're talking about today. And then in 2016, last year, we opened the new building, now called the Blavatnik Building, and that was an opportunity for us to focus on embedding performance, a narrative, into the existing collection displays. So that was another sort of leap forward that was almost a second generation move for us, and a very exciting one I'll talk about a little bit later on. So over the past 15 years, in tandem with this resurgence of interest in the form amongst contemporary artists working today in many regions globally, Tate has paid increased attention to the question of both presenting and subsequently collecting both historic and contemporary performance. I'm going to talk you through a few key live works that we acquired during this period. The first work is the work you see here. It's by Roman Ondak, titled Good Feelings in Good Times from 2003, acquired in 2005. So this was the very first live work to be accessioned into the collection, very groundbreaking for us. The work, if you know it, is an artificially uh, created cue performed by a small number of real participants. Not necessarily professional actors or performers, but people that will do a good job of cueing naturally, which is actually harder than you think. Um, so although it may not be instantly recognizable as an artwork, when it is in the gallery, and it happens every four, for 40 minutes at a time, the queue naturally forms. They stand, they wait, they queue for 20 minutes, appearing to be waiting for something to happen which ultimately never arrives. Then the queue slowly dissolves. They break for 20 minutes. It forms again in another part of the building. And it's a rather beautiful piece of invisible theater. Incredibly simple, but incredibly effective. So the performance, of course, draws of Roman Ondak's memories of communist dear accused in his native Slovakia. And the title, in that case, Good Feelings and Good Times, is, of course, very tongue-in-cheek. But when transferred to a museum space, particularly to Tate Modern, it takes on an interesting anti-spectacular sort of status. The image I'm showing you is on the new... Um, 10th floor of the new building at Tate Modern, so overlooking St. Paul's, overlooking the river. And the wonderful thing that happened when we, we showed this last year, it's been shown a few times, was, was that people really did join the queue, waiting for something to happen. So it was yeah. truly effective. An interesting parallel is this piece, a work by the Argentinian artist David Lamelas, entitled Time from 1970. We acquired it in 2006. So this is a very early example of participatory performance um, from the conceptual artist David Lamelas. It was first made in the French Alps, and that's where you see it here. 
So we acquired both this photograph, which is currently on display in our collection displays devoted to performance and participant, but we also acquired the rights to restage it. Um, and that we did alongside the work we just mentioned during the same opening week period. So we gathered people together in the turbine hall. It's a very simple piece. And David Lamelas came over to help us stage it, to learn it, to be able to sort of teach it on, which was a very magical experience. How it works again is very simple. It's a single tape or, or possibly even a white line of chalk. It could be a string, obviously not in the snow. In that case, you need a, a different color. But inside the museum, it works just as that tape. And then one person stands, you gather others, you encourage them to come and join you in this participatory piece. The, the work begins when you announce the time. I would say the time, hold that minute, and then pass it on to my neighbor, almost like a kind of Chinese whisper. And it continues along the line until it reaches the final person who then very loudly announces to the world the time. So it's this very beautiful, again, very simple idea that we all share one universal time of the present. And in Tate Modern, a very international audience that we had there, it was wonderful to hear the time spoken in many different languages. Another work is this piece by Jennifer Alora and Guilmo Calzadilla, The Balance of Power from 2007. This is a performance enacted by three people who perform warrior yoga poses in real military uniforms specific to the region in which it's staged. A very important work for us was the acquisition of Tino Segal's This is Propaganda, a work from 2002 acquired in 2005. It's enacted by a single female interpreter. That's Segal's chosen term for his performers. He won't use the term performance, rather situation. That woman is dressed as a real museum guard in the uniform of the institution so that she blends in with the infrastructure of the museum. And she sings a single phrase. This is propaganda. You know, you know, this is propaganda. Every time the visitor enters the gallery space. Immediately after singing that word, she verbally announces, Tino Segal, this is propaganda, 2002. And that serves to inform the visitor of the artist's name, the title, and the date in place of an actual physical written label. And this work, I'm not showing you here because it exemplifies uh, all of his artistic production since the late 1990s, during which time he's explored the possibility of making art without creating a physical object. So there's a, re a conceptual requirement of Segal's work that it must never be documented in any material form. So there are no images, no videos. There's a few illegal ones taken online. It's very hard to control that. Um, but interestingly also, the acquisition of the work could only take place in a verbal contract process. So there is no paperwork, there is no material trace of the work actually entering the museum. It was taught to the people who were present at the time. My colleague, who's now at the DEA, Jessica Morgan, uh, our head of conservation. That knowledge is then parted on to the next colleague and the next, and I recently um, was responsible for displaying, presenting the work last summer, so now I know how it's done. But when I leave, I again will have to pass that, that knowledge on. So it's a very interesting form of embodied knowledge. It's a logic that sort of stems from the dance tradition, really, and Segal famously trained in choreography and also in economics. So this work, which Segal describes as a constructed situation, an interesting relationship to the Situationist International, that use of language, um, is performed, like these previous works discussed, by performers working in shifts. And importantly, it's enacted continuously for the duration of the gallery hours. So like any other object on display, it obeys the same conditions. It's not a performance like an event that happens once and then ends. It's there continuously, continuously present. So this commitment to a non-material aesthetic economy is something Segal makes possible through movement, through song, and famously also through conversation. Another very important work for us, which we're 
very proud to present here this evening is uh, Nedko Solokov's A Light Black and White 1998, which we acquired in 2009. This work is performed by a team of two painters, two decorators, dressed in overalls, who together paint the walls of a single gallery space. The room begins half black and half white, and that's how it must be contained. They also work continuously throughout the full duration of the gallery hours, and they work overlaying one color with the other in a continuous performance. They are allowed to break. They have signs, a 10-minute pause, a lunch break pause. Nedko is here this afternoon. I'm conscious if I make any mistakes, I will be corrected. <laughs> okay, so far. Um, and so it's this wonderful situation that the visitor encounters unexpectedly. Ideally, the work is situated, surrounded by other galleries so that you happen on it rather unexpectedly. So the works I've just been discussing can be essentially understood as instructions or as scores for live performances to be recreated or represented. But it's important to note that performance has also entered the museum's permanent collection as photographic and video documentation of actions and also as performance-inflected objects. One such example is one of the most important works by the Serbian artist Marina Abramovic, Rhythm Zero, from 1974, a work we just acquired in 2017. The work comprises 72 objects set out on this long white table you can see here, as well as 69 slides projected onto the gallery wall above. And what those slides project are the documentation of a performance of the same title that took place in 1974 in, at Studio Mora in Naples from 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. So it's a very extraordinary work in which for a period of six hours, visitors were invited to use any of the objects on the table, which included a loaded gun, to inflict pleasure or pain on the artist who submitted herself to their treatment. The objects that we displayed here at Tate Modern are of course replicas of the original props used. Um, we acquired a, a list, you can see it in the center of the table, that stipulates all the elements that should be on display. Many of them are perishable items, like bread and grapes, which need to be replaced each time the work is displayed. Of course, when we displayed it at Tate Modern, the gun was decommissioned and also not loaded, but still the sense of that threat, that real danger that she inflicted on her own body is very real. Now, Ramovic stated, the experience I drew from this work was that in your own performances, you can go very far, but if you leave decisions to the public, you can be killed. And when she came to see the work installed at Tate Modern in June last year, she told me the story of how the performance ended, which was when the loaded gun at 2 a.m. in the morning was thrust to her head and her own hand was grasped around the trigger. A fight broke out and then of course the performance had to be abruptly ended. She looked in the mirror and saw a single white hair in her otherwise black mane. So for obvious reasons, this is a work that the artist would not like us to recreate. <laughs> um, and it's an example of the way in which performance and its history enters the permanent collection in a multitude of ways that embody not just scores for ephemeral pieces to be displayed, but also physical objects as well. Another example of such a work is this piece by Rebecca Horn, Mechanical Body Fan from 1973. So it's a work that exists as an object uh, that's intended to be activated, as you can see it here, worn by Rebecca. So it's designed to be placed over the shoulders of a female performer and it extends down her front and back and it's, hold, it's held in place by these straps that you can see passing over her waist and between her legs. 
When the performer is at rest, the wings hang down, but by shifting her weight, the performer can swing or fully rotate each of these fabric fans, so that viewed from either side, they form an infinite number of shapes between a half and a full circle, as you can see it here. So this actual object we displayed alongside this photograph of Rebecca Horn, showing how it can be activated. The work is too, too vulnerable, too fragile to be used by the public. Another example of the way in which performance history has entered the collection is, of course, as, um, as documentation filmed in this case. This is a film record of a solo performance by the great late Trisha Brown by Babette Mangold. It's called Water Motor 1978. We inquired it in 2015. It's a work that was originally shot on 35 millimeter film, but can be displayed here as a video, either as a projection or on a monitor. This is one of my very favorite works in the Tate collection. It's by the Italian situationist uh, Giuseppe Pino Galizio. It's titled Industrial Painting from 1958. So this is a very interesting example. It looks a lot more like a traditional art object combining sculpture and painting. It's actually a 74 meter long painted canvas here wrapped around this wooden spool. He made it using a painting machine. He used to create these enormous great spools of industrial painting, collectively produced, and then sold by the meter, chopped up like pizza uh, in Alba in Italy. Very interesting anti-commercial gesture. So while Tate has been pioneering in this field and collecting performance, I want to also stress that we're not working alone in isolation. Um, and that over the past 15 years has been an accelerated effort from many of our colleagues across museums to bring live performance into their permanent collections. And notable examples of working alongside us are MoMA in New York, the Van Arbor Museum in Eindhoven, Frack Lorraine in Metz, and the Saravas Foundation in Porto, and SF MoMA in San Francisco as well. So there really is a big concerted effort to, to start to fully represent a history that has previously perhaps been considered a footnote to the con canonical histories of, of history of art. So it, it's really our aim to create, of course, one of the most significant collections of performance and performance-related work internationally. But of course, we can't be fully encyclopedic in that approach. But moreover, we actually are concerned as well. We're working closely with our colleagues in the archive and the conservation department and with learning to think about the ways that these holdings of performance and performance inflected objects in the collection can both illuminate our existing histories and also reflect on the existing objects in the collection that might be activated or displayed or reapproached in new ways. So I wanted to turn now to talk about the programming element of performance, the Tate Live program at Tate Modern. The tanks that I mentioned earlier are these wonderful spaces um, at the very base of the museum. You can see them here in construction. They are called the tanks because they actually house the oil. They were oil tanks originally when Tate Modern was the Bankside power station. So they held the oil that generated the fuel that powered the power station that created the electricity that ran the city. So they're this rather extraordinary cavernous spaces. They're raw concrete. And as I mentioned earlier, designated now for performance film and working in installation. So they house collection displays, works from the collections made in those media, but they also are a wonderful arena for us to prevent, present live performance. And this is one of the very first performance that happened here um, by the wonderful Belgian choreographer and dancer, Anna Theresa de Kiersmacher. So this is the piece that she opened with in 2012, a piece called Faza, four movements, the music of Stieg Reich. Uh, it's an adaptation of her very critically acclaimed work Faza that she first performed in 1982, and it had the most beautiful lighting design by Anne Veronica Janssen. So you can see the, the rawness of this space, that it's really stripped back. This is the, uh, the space we refer to as the south tank. There's the south and the east. And this one, you can just about see on the ceiling, has an acoustic treatment. So it's great for presenting 
work with sound, with moving image. And here, just uh, allowing a wonderful dancer just to perform with nothing but lighting alone and, and with the soundtrack, just with people gathered together on the floor. It's a wonderful space for collective viewing. So that was the first way that the live program really asserted itself at Tate Modern. That was the physical space that we didn't have before, that no museum had really thought was necessary for performance. And then we moved on uh, to a virtual program, something called the BMW Tate Live Performance Room. So it was a series of performances commissioned for web broadcast. And the series was streamed live both on Tate's website and also on its YouTube channel between 2012 and 2015. So these were new commissions made specifically for this online broadcast. Um, and the viewers across the world were encouraged to chat with each other via social media channels during the performance and then put questions to the artist and my colleague Catherine Wood in the Q&A afterwards. The first one was by the French artist Jerome Bell. Um, and then they've, they've gone on to, they, to finish with this final work by the artist Mary Reed Kelly, which I'm going to play you a little excerpt of. So each performance in the series is archived now and available to view online. So if you have a little time and you're interested, everything is there to be, to be viewed. But bear with me while I try and make this link work. I was a jumper and a sweater. At the rail, I paused. You shouted, vault. And if we fractured, then that's not my fault. What cranium could hold such malice and treat a faithful foot so callous? <laughs> no artists were hurt in the making of this work, I must stress. Shut up! Shut up, you barking dog, you ankle biter. I'm sure you're happy now that your load is lighter. You were hoodwinked by the cerebellum, bought her lies as fast as she could sell them. And then the frontal cortex shared a wish, a conspiracy to feed the fish with me. I'm not a sandwich crust. I told you to beware of brain trust. I'm so betrayed right now, I'm on a platter, a herring's lunch, a poet's subject matter. You made an ego trip on plain concrete. That's how you brought the legs down to your feet. longer do I have to listen to this moaning, to this pissing? I don't blame anyone for wanting out. I don't blame clumsy feet or hungry trout. I don't blame the head. She had it hard. She also had a donor card. Any minute now they'll come and snag me, the surgeons with their plastic baggie. While you all decompose like Bach or more so, I'll be FedExed to another torso. Go try to find a pulse, you rotting pile. Were you in the Thames with us or in the Nile? We've gone tits up like Cleopatra minus snakes and dignity and dryness. At least this carnage is a respite from the thrills of metabolizing booze and pills. No one liked you, head. You were always crying. I'm chopped liver, so you made hash of dying. Oh, get your pancreas out of a twist. I think I hear my cardiologist. He's coming with a sterile igloo cooler. He knows I don't belong in here with losers. The head must not have realized what's at stake. My genius can't be snuffed by her mistake. What are you, the Beethoven of organs? I'm the heart of the matter. You're the VP of gore. Well, you're the pollock of splatter. You're a funny smelling valentine. You're not fit for Frankenstein. I smell too. I've never had the rank of leader. 
I've always been a bottom feeder. I'm the raw deal, the goose that's cooked, the shit-faced and the overlooked. I ate filth and was in filth submersed, but see the light now that the stomach's burst. I stink, therefore I am. Cast off all vanity, cause this is awful. This is awful head, don't try to hide. This is who you are inside. I can't dismember when I felt so loose, even on that diet of all juice. This is awful, this is true. The time is tripe for my debut. I'm free at last and know I'm bound for glory in this theater in the drowned. But head, how did you make this holy mess? Now that your guts are spilled, confess. I'll leave it there for now, but that's the wonderful Mary Reed Kelly, This Is Awful, um, from 2015. So next, I wanted to talk to you about a very experimental project, um, a project called If Tate Modern was Musée de la Danse from 2015. It was a project that was a collaboration with the French dancer and choreographer Boris Charmatz, who was then still is now the director of Musée de la Danse in Rennes. In short, what it was was something quite radical, which was to transform the museum through dance. So for two days in May in 2015, 100 dancers took over the museum. And the program unfolded across the, the entire gallery over the course of that weekend. And I wanted to just play a little excerpt, a little summary of the video, because it's very hard to, to give you a kind of verbal sense of just how extraordinary it was to see that total takeover. So I'll just play a little bit of what Musée de la Danse that weekend was like. more beautiful than the one with eyes open and then the reverse. So this is a mass public warm-up in the turbine hall. And yeah. And then this is very surprising for English visitors to get this physical so early in the morning. So it's wonderful for us to see. And look, the head, the hands, and then oh, turn. It's an example of one of the professional performances that then took place as the day unfolded. free and open to everybody, so you just happened upon this rather surprising situation.
So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what it was like, this total takeover by Musée de la Danse. One of the wonderful things was a very large disco ball suspended from the turbine hall ceiling, and at the end of the day, it turned into a kind of mass disco moment. Again, very surprising in England, especially in a museum. Um, when he first became director of the Musée de la Danse, Enren bonnes um produced a manifesto for this dancing museum. And I'd like to quote a couple of sections which seem particularly pertinent today. The manifesto begins, we are at a time in history where a museum can be alive and inhabited as much as a theater, can include a virtual space and offer a contact with dance that can be at the same time practical, aesthetic and spectacular. He describes the dancing museum as a museum of complex temporalities, one that deals with both the ephemeral and the perennial, the experimental and heritage. Active, reactive, mobile, it is a viral museum which can be grafted onto in other places and can spread dance where it is not expected. And I think that's exactly what this project at Tate Modern achieved and something that we really feel now reverberating in our program today. So you can see this is the beginning, the mass participatory warm-up. And a very important element of this project also was the insertion of dance into the collection displays, so it really spread through the museum. So this is the first time we allowed performance in dialogue with the works in this way. It was a project called 20 Dances for the 20th Century, so really kind of rethinking what a museum of 20th century art might be. And this is a wonderful image of um, the French choreographer Jerome Bell um, performing in front of an Andy Warhol. So speeding forward in time to 2016, um, the tanks were closed for a few years um, for the new Blavatnik building to be built because they were built immediately. Uh, the building was built above those spaces. So um, to celebrate the opening of that building, um, we instigated a new six-week program. This is the new Blavatnik building you can see here and the space that the, the people are standing on, that's the roof of the tanks below, those concrete spaces we saw earlier. Um, so the new building has created two things. It's created this new wonderful outside platform, the first time we can show performance really outside on this new terrace, which is very exciting. Um, but also this wonderful stair well, connects the collection displays, the museum above, with the tanks. So whereas before they were kind of a side annex to the turbine hall, now they are fully integrated with the collection. And it's very interesting to see because actually this is often the first point of call for visitors to museums. So they might begin their understanding of, the, of Tate Modern and the story it's telling with these performance spaces. So that's a wonderful thing for us to be grappling with. So we open with a three-week pro program of live works from the collection I mentioned earlier, one of which was Tanya Bruguera's uh, Tatlin Whisper Number no. 5, the, the Tina Segal, the Roman on Deck, and the David Lamelas, and a work by Amalia Pika. But we also did something quite important, which was we integrated new live commissions with actual objects from the collection. So what you're seeing here um, are sculptural works from the 1960s. Um, the purplish works are by Charlotte Posenenska, the blue by Rashida Reen, and in the corner, the mirror cubes by Robert Morris. So this was a display that wanted to take minimalism, really, and turn it on, it, on its head and, and bring it back to its participatory roots. So all of these works on display are meant to, in some way, actively engage the viewer. So the Posenenska works are meant to be inhabited physically occupy them, you move through, you open the doors, you, you walk through to another space, and sort of portals. The Rashida Reen are meant to be actively stacked, so the participant is engaged in creating a new structure each time. And the Robert Morris, of course, because they're so reflective, they, they dissolve one's own experience of the object. So important works that have been traditionally sort of abstracted from that history of participation. So we showed those alongside two live commissions 
Um, one was by the wonderful Romanian artists Alexander Perich and Manuel Pelmas, and it was titled Public Collection Tape Modern. Here are their performance um, at the press day, it looks like. Um, and this work uh, was performed by this, this brilliant group who enacted live transpositions of works made in other media. So it was a, a cycle, uh, an ongoing action, which was like a kind of sophisticated game in which these performers would temporarily occupy the form of an of a image of a familiar artwork, which would then dissolve, leaving a trace in the memory and disappear and morph into another. Um, this work is Delacroix's Liberty Guiding the People. This is the Mona Lisa. And this, one of my favorites, if you're familiar with the work, Doris Salcedo's Turbine Hall commissioned the long crack that ran through the concrete turbine hall floor. And this they created, one person, one, one person, as though the crack was slowly moving through the room. So it's a very interesting work that addresses the role of the institution as one that collects and displays art and really rethinks the idea of what a permanent collection might be. Anna Teresa de Kiesmack have returned um, to Tate Modern with a work entitled Work Travai Arbeid in 2016, just after the opening program. And this was really an extension of the ideas around Musée de la Danse, really thinking what it might it mean for choreography to perform as an exhibition. And that was the starting point for this piece. It's an exhibition that was originally prevent, uh, presented in Wheels in Brussels. And it was a, involved a sort of very intricate intertwining of sound and movement that, that ran through the turbine hall. You can see the dances of roses here. It also involved her wonderful musicians, Ictus, who were playing live. And again, this it's a, it's a recurring theme in the story I'm telling here, but it, it occupied the exhi exhibition hours, the full museum standard opening day. The title, of course, Work. For Anna Teresa was really thinking, what might it mean to show the work of a dancer? What might it mean to sort of expose that, something that's often quite private? What might it mean to put that in the museum on display? Here are some more images. Really beautiful work, just happening through movement um, and sound alone. And one of the interesting elements, too, is that she came with some of her... Um, her young students from parts, her, her school in Brussels, and they worked outside on that new terrace I mentioned on the top of the tank. So they were working through their own choreography. And then in the space just alongside the dance floor, we also uh, ran workshops each day where dancers from the company could actually teach the choreography from the work to any keen participants. i like now to start to finish up by talking about our very latest um, project, something which we launched in March earlier this year, and it's called the BMW Tate Live Exhibition. It's a very new experimental model for us and one that's been very exciting to produce. Um, the concept is 10 days and six nights of installation and live performance commission. So the idea is it's an exhibition that unfolds not just in space, but also in time. Very often for museums, performance programs are almost a sort of side event program. There's something that happens almost as a secondary program. And this is very important for us because it happens now annually. It's being instituted into the existing exhibition program alongside Picasso and Digliani and, and everybody else. So that's really important for us to be giving that platform for performance, to be treating it um, in this way. So this March, we had the great pleasure of working with the Japanese folk sculptor, Fujiko Nakaya. Um, she was commissioned to transform this terrace with an immersive folk sculpture. These are works that she's been making since the 1970s, which are site-specific. They involve pressurized water nozzles that create this beautiful choreography between the water vapor 
um, and the natural elements, so it's shifting all the time. One of the themes of this exhibition, was, which was conceived as very intergenerational and also very international, um, was the idea of host environments. And Fujiko created this wonderful sculpture and then invited the dancer and choreographer Min Tanaka to perform in it at dusk, which was just the most wonderful experience. There's, there's some documentation on it on the Tate Facebook website. We actually we streamed it live. And the, it was also animated by um, a sound and lightscape by Ryuichi Sakamoto and dumb type Shiro Takatani. So it had this wonderful hum, but also these strong white strobes. So it was really quite an extraordinary environment to be in and an incredible stage setting for this performance to unfold. The fog in its own right was quite a performance, but this was really extraordinary. Um, Fujiko was involved with experiments in art and technology in the 70s, along with people like Roger, Robert Rauschenberg. Um, and she was active in a countercultural art scene at that time. And she really wanted to make a form of art making that went beyond representation to interact with the environment and with society. And that's really those ideas were something that we wanted to permeate through this exhibition. She sees technology as a way of bringing the wilderness and unpredictability of nature into the field of art and of challenging the notion that the experience must be contained within the gallery, something also that we were keen to explore. So in place of the physical stability of the museum, the fog formed a kind of soft architecture of its own, a changing habitat that could be disorientating and sometimes even frightening because it was suddenly become so thick that invisibility was almost impossible. So that was the work that sat uh, on top of the tanks as a kind of announcement of the exhibition. And downstairs, we worked with a wonderful artist from the Dominican Republic based now in Berlin, Isabel Lewis. And I wanted to just play you a little short video of her describing her work, which is the most extraordinary multi-sensorial practice. She comes from a background in dance. She's also a wonderful DJ. She creates what she calls um, occasions. And we'll hear her talking a little bit about those now. sensual environment, lush in a way. You know, gardens are, for me, a very central, let's say, reference point for the occasions. The invitation is always there to dance, to taste, to smell, to speak, and to interact. shifting that idea towards the idea of a host. Think about choreography much more now in terms of in what way is it shaping the energy of a particular space rather than you know, what is the movement vocabulary for me, it becomes fun to think about, you know, how can I address uh, these different aspects of what it actually means to be human and bring us out in a certain way, bring out our own kind of bodily awareness uh, to a situation. 
is it a space where people can experience themselves, can experience beauty, can experience their interrelation with objects or with plants, with other species? The sort of integration of life and art, that's something I very much relate to. The value system that I'm, I'm sort of after has, I guess, little to do with what we understand as art, but maybe a lot more with you know, what does it mean to try to live in a kind of flourishing way as a contemporary human. That gives you a little bit of an introduction to Isabel's practice. It was fantastic to have her there in residence over those 10 days. As you can see, she's working with, with very brilliantly with sound, with music, with dancers, with scent as well. That's one of the elements she actually sort of crafts. Um, and using her experience as a DJ, she really composes um, with the energy of the, of the space. So there were moments when you entered um, the gallery which were very quiet, very meditative, very tranquil, and other moments where it felt almost like it was approaching a sort of party situation, which is very interesting to think about navigating those different sort of atmospheres inside a museum. This is one of the installations that she created. You got a sense of it earlier on. She actually works with real plant life. Um, and here are her, some of her musicians and her dancers preparing for the day ahead. So it was a, a great experiment for us, really, to work with this sort of approach inside the museum. Um, importantly, too, she also used it as a platform for critical thinking about what it might mean to work in this way. So alongside these more sensorial pleasures, she also sets up situations where she has quite robust intellectual debate as well, which is a really exciting way of us thinking about how to integrate the usually traditional boundaries between curatorial and our learning or education departments. So those really came together in her work. So alongside those two installations, and there was another by the Mumbai Collective um, Camp Film Collective, we, we programmed six nights of ticketed performances. And what was really important for us was to work across generations. This is a piece by the artist Paul Mahecki, a French artist based in London, a piece called Mubu. Um, and he's here performing with his collaborator Cedric, who's actually a curator in Nottingham, not usually a drummer. Um, but it was a, a wonderful platform to be able to invite young artists um, who, you know, at, a, at an earlier point in their career, emerging artists, to produce something new. Um, across these six nights. This is the Italian uh, producer and DJ Lorenzo Senni. And this is a really fantastic piece called Minor Matter by uh, Lichia Lewis, also based in Berlin. So we're working across dance, film, sound, really trying to use these spaces in an experimental way. And those nights on, um, were really quite special. Which brings us now to the present, which is what we're working on, which is the second of these Tate Live exhibitions, which will open in March next year. So I have to encourage you all to come to London if you possibly can. Um, this time, we are working with another pioneer artist, um, the wonderful American artist Joan Jonas, who is really groundbreaking in working with performance and with video. She's just an incredibly exceptional artists, and we're very, very proud to be presenting her work in London. We're working with some of her historic works. Um, this is a piece called Mirage. This is Joan performing there herself, and she will do for us in London as well. Um, so we're going to be reconfiguring, together with Joan, some of these historic pieces. So thinking what it means to present work from the 70s in this present moment. It's very relevant for Joan. It's not really a reenactment as such, because throughout her practice, she's always been reconfiguring and reworking. That's very much within the kind of DNA of her work. So she will be performing, but also with, together with the wonderful um, Jason Moran, who's a very brilliant um, jazz composer and musician. Um, she, that will be on the opening weekend, and we're also working with the British artist 
the Turner Prize winning Mark Lecky, um, who's created an exorcism for us, which will take place on the final weekend. Um, we're also incredibly excited to be working with Sylvia Palacios Whitman, um, not a collaborator of Joan Jonas's, but a uh, very much a peer of the same generation, um, also working in New York in the 70s. So we're really excited to bring her works, which in a very interesting way, this is her performing Green Hands. She told me rather brilliantly that she can bring these over to London in her hand luggage. So <laughs> I hope that is the case. Um, but really, this, her work is very interesting for us in the, in the way that it blurs the boundaries between sculpture between objects and performance, something that is really at the heart of what we do is making those connections between the history of objects and between the history of things. These are performances that she makes um, in the moment. So she appears on stage with rudimentary kind of arte povera type materials, cardboard, basic fabric, really, really sort of simple stuff. An object will unfold and then disappear in the making of that moment. So very simple gestures, but really very beautiful. So we're very excited to have her performing in London for the first time. So what I've been hoping to emphasize this afternoon is really the way in which those two histories are so very much intertwined, but the objects and the history of ephemeral experience of art and the way in which collecting performance history challenges um, the existing boundaries and structures of the museum. I wanted to end with this live exhibition structure as an indication of just how far the relationship between performance and the art museum has come from that first anti-institutional gesture I first described in the 1960s to the integration of experimental performance into the core exhibition program of the museum. To, to borrow a metaphor from Boris Sharmatz, performance has entered the museum like a Trojan's horse. It might look like a sculpture, but it contains a living army within it. And that simple fact has great implications for the work of the museum and challenges our existing systems of ways of working in ever new and very complex ways. So we're now at the start of an incredibly exciting new era for Tate Modern, when performance is no longer a footnote to the canonical histories of modern art, but rather a vital aspect of the work of the museum that is fully integrated into its collections and its displays. So it's been my very great pleasure to share this work with you this afternoon. And I think now we're gonna move to a discussion, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Thank you so much. I wanted to maybe just make a kind of, to share my um, impressions is that even though you have uh, historical um, performances, they seem to be very connected to the present to the present context. <clears throat> so is this an um, important part uh, of your uh, collection or uh, the way that you display the works? Um, do they have to always be in, in relation to the present? Or you, you find a way to, um, to uh, translate the context from, from when the work has been done in the past? Um, great question. Yes, I think that, I mean, the, the interconnections are really important. Um, I think nobody's working in isolation and contemporary art today is always, um, it's our job really to, to create that context to show where the work stems from. Um, our job really, we have to work to tell that backstory because performance has been incredibly important. Um, since the early 20th century and incredibly important in the post-war years. So it's not a new history. This isn't something radically different that suddenly appeared over the past 15 years. Live experimentation is, is really the kind of lifeblood of, of contemporary art today. Um, so it's very important for us to, to articulate that, um, to make those connections and to chart those histories. And I do say histories with an emphasis on the plural because they are multiple. Um, but yes, absolutely, the two together are very important to us. 
And um, another question regarding your acquisitions. Uh, do you always have the right to reconstruct, to reenact the per performance, or sometimes you're only able to show a documentation of the performance? Um, it depends on the work. Um, so as I, I showed, showed you the Babette Mangold piece, um, the documentation of Trisha Brown performing, that's an example, and there are many others of phot photography as well, where the work exists purely as document. Um, and that's a very important way of showing those historic pieces. Um, of the contemporary, the truly live performances that have entered the collection so far, yes, we, we do. We have the rights for reenactment, which is... Um, very exciting because it means that the work can, can travel in exhibitions, can be shown across Tate sites in many different ways. Um, and the wonderful thing, uh, we were speaking with Nedko last night and, and, and talking about his piece, and it's, it's fantastic to, to be working with contemporary artists at this time because you, you get to know there's so many different conditions and circumstances of these works, and it's wonderful to be working with living artists to realize the different permutations, the inbuilt flexibility or not, depending on <laughs> who you're talking to. Um, but it's, it's very important, I think, um, for these works that exist as scores to have those, those dialogues with the artists. And that's one of the great pleasures of, of working with performance. Uh, first one is, um, <clears throat> we all know that uh, museums have uh, this public face, this uh, whole suite um, where the work is presented, but then uh, there are these depots where the work is stored, so I'm wondering what is the size of the depot for the collection of performance. Ah. <laughs> uh, then I'm interested uh, <clears throat> whether these works uh, that you acquire are limited editions or unlimited or... And then, <clears throat> and the last one is uh, really, I had this uh, funny thought if uh, if especially with uh, related to the work of uh, Tino Segal, if uh, the curator who is the keeper of the work uh, decides to leave without, for some reasons, without <laughs> explaining, <laughs> will it be considered a criminal act or a Ooh. theft? Or a <laughs> I wouldn't want to test it. What great questions. Um, yeah, that, that, that is one of the great things about performance. Um, you, it's limited in storage costs, but of course it's very high in production costs. Um, the edition size, it depends on each artwork. Um, so, for instance, the work um, uh, A Life Black and White, for instance, is an edition of 5 plus 1 AP, um, and we hold the fifth of that edition. Um, other works, such as David Lamelas's Time, I believe is truly unique, and so we hold that one work. It just depends on each individual piece. Um, it's like a, like a film or a video or any other edition artwork. It, it operates in the same way. Um, as for leaving in a rage with the knowledge of the Tina Segal, um, the thing about it is that every time these works are acquired, the, the artists will sit down with our, our brilliant conservators. And so they'll log a, a wonderful interview with the artist um, about the, all the detail of that work. Um, Tina very sensibly also works with producers, so people um, almost, again, as a sort of a logic from the dance tradition, people that really know the work, they really know exactly how it should be made. Um, so if I were to leave, or all my colleagues were to leave in some extraordinary incident, we could by, call on one of them and they would come and, and make the work happen. But it is a, it's a very interesting idea when, when the work suddenly becomes embodied knowledge in that way. Very challenging and interesting. Thank you for the questions. Um, what is the actual um, interest uh, of the Tate and you as a curator in relation to that uh, new context of society shaping up and promoting a kind of invisible uh, invisibility towards the political war, if I can say, between um, places, countries, in a way, not stated, is there a kind of forecast that you can say, maybe perhaps personal, what is the relation between art and as a social tool, as a powerful weapon uh, in mm -hmm. relation to future wars, or like what is the function of the body in the 
in the arts now, not related so much to the history. Mm. The surge of interest, the drive to work in the live moment, to create collaboratively produced exhibitions, and thinking particularly of Group Zero in Dusseldorf, who created these wonderful night exhibitions that happened all. Um, or Jink and Kobo in, in Tokyo, also in the early 50s. Um, from conversations I have with artists like Otto Pino, it really became clear that it was motivated by that, the impetus to draw people together. It was very utopian. Uh, they had just experienced world wars. They were, weren't going to make those same mistakes again. There was a truly genuine um, drive towards live making as something good, something that could bring about a new um, approach to society, I believe. So that was, that's sort of a, a brief nutshell summary of that moment. But today, what does the body mean? I think it's interesting also that we're, we're seeing this surge of interest in performance again post 2000. I think there, we can't ignore the rise of the digital, the screen that we are all so wedded to. I think um, perhaps there is something in that, that the return to something embodied, something that can only be experienced in the present moment. And again, something that is collectively shared, I think feels very important in this moment, increasingly important. Um, I guess we'll see. We'll see how that progresses as, as these testing times continue, really. But I do think it's, um, it's interesting to see those two moments in parallel, definitely. Um, at the moment, we, uh, we know for sure we will do uh, another three BMW Tate Live exhibitions. And then um, I hope that we'll move into a third, a third phase after that. But um, even imagining 2021 right now is, is terrifying. So I'll leave it there for now. So the core of the concept is that all of these exhibitions are time-based time or not necessarily? Yeah, essentially. It's, it's, um, it's almost a mini festival format. So it's allowing space within the museum's calendar really to dedicate time to experimental practices. Um, it's really important too though that it's intergenerational. So we're, we're working with people in their 80s, people in their late 20s. It's, it's a great opportunity to put those two together and, and, and very stimulating, I think. Uh, life situations are calculated in terms of presentation. Like, uh, do you admit that something unexpected, very unexpected could happen? <laughs> yes, absolutely. It almost always does. I, mean, I think that's one of the, um, the joys and the challenges of working with performance. I mean, it depends, of course, on the artist. Some people are very organized. It's the whole thing is very scripted, very, very controlled. Um, but I think that's one of the wonderful things about working with the live medium is that you allow that space for something unexpected to happen. You, you give away a little bit of control. Um, it isn't finished. It isn't resolved. It's happening in that live moment of collective witnessing. You know. um, anything could happen, and, and, and it does. <laughs> so the, the visitors come with the presumption that something really, really unexpected could happen to them or... I th mm -hmm. Yes, I think people probably come to our, our program expecting a few surprises, yes. I think that's good, it's good to keep people guessing. And, you know, to challenge ourselves too, I think that's um, an important point as well. My question would be, how are the new technologies affecting the way of collecting performance art? And as you mentioned, obviously performance art is something to be experienced and something you live in the moment. But on the other hand, I also admire the way of the live streaming and you giving a chance to people who are not there to experience performance art as well. So my question would be, are you considering using means such as virtual realities to capture some of the performances or something even more advanced in a way? Thank you. Yes, is the, is the answer. I think we're incredibly open to all those different technologies. Um, the performance room example that you, you saw, the YouTube program, 
that was a real experiment in thinking what it might mean to, to present work from the museum in that virtual way. And exactly as you say, it was brilliant to have that global reach. There's audiences all around the world um, watching those pieces. We're sort of, we're now navigating new territory, really. We want to kind of move on. We, we're thinking at the moment very imaginatively about live streaming. Um, social media, for all its terrible uh, qualities, is also a wonderful way to be able to spread um, performance online um, through, through Facebook Live and Instagram. It's very cheap broadcasting medium. If anybody's thinking of streaming some performance, we recommend it. Um, but yes, I think as more and more artists become engaged, of course, with these new developments in technology, we, we are very interested to be engaging with them too. Um, absolutely, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, um, all, all these things are, uh, are ways of working we're taking on board because they're all new ways engaging with reality. So I think they're a logical extension of all the things we've been talking about. And it's an exciting time to be thinking about what that might mean. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the concept of temporality. So I'm wondering what is the, um, the character, character of the interaction between these live artistic practices and the temporality of the museum? And how does this change the life of the museum? Job titles are an interesting indication. Um, Previously, my job would have been keeper, not curator. And now I think my role actually approaches something more like producer. Um, and that's really an indication of just how far things have moved away from the protection, the conservation of the object that was to be kept for all eternity um, towards something that is produced temporarily, some, something ephemeral. Um, the logic of the museum, though, regardless, is still to preserve, is, is to store the DNA, the logic, the, the, the basic criteria of the work, even if it doesn't have a, a heavy material presence. Um, so it's really about uh, taking a new approach to the ephemeral um, and to understanding how best to preserve these practices that might not um, be dominated by object-based artworks. So it, it, it challenges the, the logic of the museum in very, very interesting ways because we are still working with that same model and as the, the name permanent collection suggests, um, we're, we're fighting that really. Um, but that's, that's a great thing and that's something that really challenge, challenges all levels of the institution. It seems to be... Um the time-based works, uh, even though they involved objects, they seem to be very um, significant for, the, for our times, like especially in connection with the um, internet and the digital medias. So even though there's a lot of projects that are produced in objects, there's always something uh, apart that happens um, in, a, in a time span. Mm. So... Um, so maybe that's why performance is that important today. Oh, that, this, is, this is just my comment. <laughs> um, and it's very interesting the way you present uh, this uh, spirit of, of the time in, in your program. Um, I guess it's also the drive to experiment, I think, is, what I, is a recurring theme as well. I think we feel it, but we see it, and that's what's so inspiring, and we, we respond to that. Um, and I guess these multiple time-based media, they really allow that. Um, not, not to say or in any way disregard you know, traditional practices of, of making, not at all. And I think it's very interesting to see artists working today across many different media. Um, it's wonderful now that we have art schools that allow that, that facilitate that way of working, that you don't have to be purely committed to a single... Um, formal medium, a single craft in that, in that sort of modernist um, way of thinking. Um, it's exciting that, that all the options are, are open. Thank you again, Isabella, for Thank the you so wonderful much. conversation and for the presentation. And I hope to see you soon again in Bulgaria. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you.
for um, your interest. Благодаря за интереса и заповядайте отново бъдеще.